Everyone, my name is Arthur, and I'm here with Yaka about marking packets with Rich Metadata. So of course, you're probably thinking, we already have metadata today. There's already meta and SKB. Why do we need to do anything else? And of course, everyone thinks about the SK bus mark. This is really kind of the only real metadata we have that's present throughout the network. So you can kind of set an FTP right at the end, and even all the way up to user space with SO mark. And in between, you can use an XFRM and IP tables. You can persist it for a global call mark. You can do all kinds of cool things. So it's not really clear what is even the mark. It's kind of nothing. It's just mark 32 bits of stuff. But also it's everything. It ends up being this 32-bit clock panel of everything you could possibly need. Routing, firewalling, missing, encryption, decryption. Uh, and Joe Stringer at LTP 2020 gave a great talk on the packet mark in the cloud native world and everything it's used for there. This mark really is used for everything. It's kind of the tape of the, the network stack. You need two things to talk to each other, you get the mark. But there's even this registry that tracks which is the mark different services are using. Um, the problem, of course, is that we want more. Every time you want to use the mark, you kind of have to ask yourself, how many bits can I use? And it's really just, you know, how many single bits can I get for this? Which bits can I use? And will it interfere with other services? Am I going to, you know, overwrite someone else's mark accidentally and break everything? It kind of feels like we shouldn't really need a registry. But the question is, if we have these big metadata, what else could we do with, like, more metadata? So I think the classic example of trying to dispatch things is just service. Uh, so this example, we have a service here, who in user space, listening at like 1.1.1.1, and we want to get packets to it. And so in the classic example, every layer of the network stack gets kind of set up. So in XTP, we check the destination IP, and like, okay, we probably have to load that this packet. And then in routing, you also have to have a route to route it locally. And then same in IP users, you probably have to jump to that service's rules. And it's funny here, we're using socket like that, but your service could also just bind to that IP. But once again, you have to bind to that IP. And so this all works really well, and you can set it up statically. As soon as you, as soon as you want to change it, it becomes a nightmare. God forbid you want to change it in production with live traffic. So here, for example, you want to change it to 1.1.1.2. You can also change it in all four of these places. And probably you're going to mess that up somehow, or you're not going to do it as publicly. And what happens to, like, packets in flight in between all these steps? And this is a simple example where we're only using IPs. Those packets are probably also matching up ports and protocols. And probably all these steps kind of interpret it slightly differently. You're going to have all kinds of applications where everything breaks. If we had this magical metadata, we could imagine doing this in one place super early on. So we have kind of taken some creative liberties and imagine we have this meta struct in SKB where we can just set arbitrary values. And in SDP, we can map this packet to a service early on, decide, okay, this packet is for my service who, and then every other the layer of the network stack could just look at that metadata and do the right thing. That's really nice because it means you can control all this in one place. And if you want to dynamically update it, change it, or manage it, then you only have one thing now to do. And uh, this, uh, one interesting case about this is that all your traffic probably doesn't come from the external network interface. So sometimes you have traffic that also comes locally. So here we have uh, encapsulated packets, for example, wire guard packets. So these blue packets in the top are coming in, going to a first user space service called DPAP that's decapsulating and returning them and then sending them back to the kernel to actually get the service poop. Uh, so this is kind of a corner case where, in this case, we'd also want to be able to update the metadata for local routing here early on as well as we can. And this brings us to once you have such a complex set, how do you trace packets when you have this? So you have packets coming out of the kernel all the way up the network stack, you're decapsulating them in a one user space service, sending them back into the kernel, and then someone tells you, oh, dropping some packets somewhere. So this is, this is a performance problem. How do you even start looking? Here we can imagine, you know, we're dropping packets in IP table somewhere, but the encapsulated packet. And it becomes really hard to kind of trace that. And so ideally, we don't end up, oh, sorry, yeah. Ideally, you'd want to end up to be able to have, like, traces like this, where you have distributed tracing, and you can see things, you know, from one user space service through the kernel back to another user space service, and you could track the same packet through that whole thing. And then you could compare, like, a good flow to a bad flow and see, oh, hey, in this bad case, you know, for example, we're retransmitting the SKB a bunch. Why is that? what this really boils down to is being able to reliably identify packets so that you can load them in a bunch of places and put it all together. And of course, the obvious thing is you, you choose the pod tuple. Um, but maybe that's kind of tricky because it means that every time you have a probe, you have to go try to parse the pod tuple out or look at the right address, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. And also, that doesn't work as soon as you encapsulate or decapsulate your packet, so you just lose everything. Um, and it doesn't really work for user space because if you're terminating the connection in one and then starting it again, then the pod tuple can't change. And uh, you can also use the address of SKBus, and 
in there, so that's awesome. Um, but it also doesn't work across networking interfaces, and it still doesn't work across user space. But with the metadata, we can just put an ID in there. So the packet comes in, and then super early on, you generate some random ID, it doesn't really matter what it is for that packet. And then we can have it available throughout the network stack, so all your probes could go look at that ID and match on that ID, and you can get a full trace of that packet. And if you can read that metadata in user space, then the user space service can get the ID and use it again when it's doing the opposite act. So you could, you know, see in and out and correlate those together. Or you could have your service to calculate a packet and then actually track it afterwards and get full spans of like packet coming in, first network stack, calculating back through the network stack. And you've got all these kinds of complicated issues. And there are there a few use cases for this. Uh, some of these kind of like network metadata. So sometimes you, there are lots of uh, interesting information that service, user space services tend to have really good debugging facilities. So you can like have logging, observability, maybe even like sample packets and store them somewhere. Sometimes it's really interesting to correlate that with their attributes that are hard to get. So for example, in this example here, packets just who are coming in encapsulated uh, over this wire guard service, which will probably affect the RTT and you know what packets taking and the packets getting dropped. And if you imagine at the same time packets are coming straight in off the NIC, they're encapsulated, and there's a problem, it's really interesting to be able to see and you're logging, oh hey, we're having problems but only with the encapsulated packets. And so here you'd be able to set some metadata what you're decapsulating and say, hey, this packet was decapsulated originally, or it came in over the internet. Finally, there's also all the hardware metadata you can get from the NIC, which right now is kind of stuck in XTP land. You can get it on the PC, but that's kind of the end of it unless you find a host for it. Uh, so like the receive timestamp or the RSS hash. And here we could put these in the metadata and then preserve it. It even has user space access some of it. It's interesting, like the receive timestamp. And so this brings us to risk of speedy metadata. So how do we actually, what could we do to actually store this? And unfortunately, the requirements are pretty strict. Uh, probably we can't have any extra allocation because, of course, that would be expensive, and we want to be able to do this for every space company. And probably we can't add fields to SK bus because then Eric will get very sad and everyone will tell us it's too late. And it also needs to be persistent, so we can't really use the SK bus DB field because it tends to get overridden by different layers of network stack. But it turns out that even though this may seem impossible, actually everything we need already exists today. So some super smart people have already figured it all out, and we have a bedroom in the, the packet cage of SKB. And so this is accessible on XDP, and you can already use it to store metadata in there. And you can hold 256 bytes in most drivers, which is a lot more than 32 bits. And then of course, in the kernel, it's laid out kind of the same way, so it's just like in the head room of the SKB. And today, you can even access this in PC, so that's kind of where it's stuck. We have the same API, you know, you can read uh, data meta and actually just directly access the metadata if you want to. So what, what if you want to go beyond PC? Can we extend this to soft filters? Can we just add direct access to data and data meta? It seems like as long as we make sure that the users have cat perf mono cat BPS, there shouldn't really be any problems with that. And it's already an existing API. And that would let us solve the IP tables use case, because you can have rules that just have eBPS socket filters. And then, uh, of course, there's a whole bunch of series of geeky programs that help like the underscore underscore H SK bus under the structure like SK lineup, which we'd love to use. It seems like we could just mirror the socket filter API maybe and just put a data meta field in there in the context that people could direct just direct, you know, direct packet access to just the metadata. Um, and now there are some limitations to this. Right now, of course, there's no BPS support for rooting, so I can't have the BPS program to decide if I want to root a packet or not. Uh, but that's a small use case, and so we could probably keep using the mark for that. And then there are also some limitations around local traffic and making sure that SKBs are allocated with enough errors and that we have a hook earlier on metadata that could affect the speed of the local packet. But we kind of have answers to most of these. So we can have metadata, you know, in XDP, rooting kind of through the mark, in IP tables, and SK lookup. And that brings us just how do we get it to user space? And then Jacob's going to talk about that. How do we actually do that? Okay, so, so we have our, our packet represented in the network by the SKB object and the uh, page associated with that. The question is, uh, right, uh, we, we need to pass it to our application in the user space uh, so we can consume it, log it, whatever, uh, maybe re-inject it into, into the network stack. Uh, so how do we get the data from a uh, kernel memory page for, for uh, SKB data into a memory page that is mapped to a process memory of 
course, we, we do have already data channels in the BPF land between the kernel and the user space uh, in form of BPF maps. So um, we just use uh, our ring bus or ferrum bus to, to perhaps emit objects containing this metadata. Um, but that wouldn't be super nice for, 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 for the applications we feel because uh, you would be reading packets out of the socket and you would be reading some event objects out of your ring buffer and you will have to kind of uh, correlate the two to know that hey this uh, metadata event uh, is related to this packet I have just received, right? So how do we do uh, better and, and somehow uh, use uh, data channels that are associated uh, uh, with the socket objects? Um, now, uh, you can have a few uh, different scenarios here, uh, depending on whether you're using connection-oriented or connection-less sockets. Um, in the case of TCP, where, where we have listen accept semantics, it seems like it would be sufficient to, to um, read and write the metadata uh, mostly just once in the first socket lifetime. So no connection gets established uh, or you accept a connection and you, you need to read out the metadata and then you don't do it again. Whereas uh, for connection-less sockets uh, being UDP, uh, because we're multiplexing the socket for, for many um, incoming uh, network flows, that, that's very common on ingress, uh, it looks like we'll have to um, have access to reading and writing metadata multiple times, many times per socket lifetime, so the, um, the API probably needs to handle it in that way. So let's start with TCP, that, that's actually easier. Um, and perhaps here we could just uh, use the existing uh, socket option API uh, to read out our metadata. Mm -hmm. It uh, seems to be totally doable today. Um, there are some dev program uh, in the lower parts of the network stack will just, you know, store it in the headroom as Arthur has uh, described. And then we, we, uh, we do get uh, an event. Uh, we, our BPF talkup program uh, can get triggered and, or get triggered when uh, we accept uh, an incoming TCP connection. So we can react from there and kind of read out the uh, metadata from the headroom. And we can store it in, in uh, BPFF case storage. Start this program to build the uh, SKD that just came in uh, and uh, the socket that uh, that got uh, created. Right. Um, later on, uh, our process when it's called get socket will just uh, hijack that query from from BPF and return the metadata by reading it uh, uh, from SK storage and uh, writing it to a provided uh, buffer for for the option value. Nothing novel here, that's all uh, doable today. Um, if you, uh, if you uh, looked into it previously, you might know that there is one caveat there. Uh, because uh, the option value buffer is provided by user space, we actually can't uh, access it just like that from BPF because there might be a page fault. So actually the uh, glue code for, for uh, get socket option for BPF programs. Uh, it's it's just the first page because we first uh, uh, we 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 hand out kernel um, pointer to kernel memory to the program and then that's what copies out of the BPF socket to uh, to the user buffer. But we don't care about that um, here. I mean, you're you're fine as long as you're you're not trying to. Uh, access more than one page, and this is the case here because we have just uh, 200-something bytes, right? Uh, can we do the same for outgoing connections? Um, it seems so. Um, yeah, we, we, we can set uh, our metadata before we connect our socket, right? And then we can temporarily hold it in this socket storage, just like uh, previously. And we also have a corresponding event there uh, for talk ops uh, when we actively open a, co a connection. And from there, we can just copy the metadata from uh, the socket storage map into uh, SKD headroom. So, no problems there. I guess one thing that uh, we're thinking about and possibly could make life easier is 
selecting and standardizing a, a socket option level uh, number for, for VPS users so you don't need to worry about uh, running into any clashes with new socket option levels the only thing that might be a nice uh, uh, yeah, na a nice usability pain for, for them what about UDP? I have a question yeah sure which slide? Uh, can you go back to one more slide? Sure. So, one piece I'm missing, like, um, the metadata is for the socket buffers, that's right. So, potentially, the metadata could be different between uh, this time message and the next time message. Yes, I think we could do it. So, so this sets off is for the business for the whole socket. So you, you cannot change between different send message points. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, that's why that this way, uh, this recipe is mostly applicable to uh, TCP, where you get socket flow, uh, where we usually, if we say you were tracing a uh, connection, we need to trace the uh, tra the trace ID only for the, with with the first socket of the connection, right? Uh, where uh, the second part of the presentation actually will address what you what you brought up because that's the that's the case we uh, we have with UDP and that makes things harder but maybe doable as well. But what you just mentioned, right? We uh, we might need to, we need to uh, like read out and write metadata from user space and uh, to user space multiple times in case of UDP because. You can have uh, many different connections using the or flows using the same socket, and you say we want to trace all of them. So how do we do that, right? The, the socket option no longer works because then we can have one connection coming and overwriting our socket uh, storage. So uh, we need something that is directly re related to the packet we're reading out or saying. Socket Cleaver is uh, already uh, an existing solution with, within Socket API, and that's an ancillary message uh, that, that we already use within the network stack for passing things like timestamps. So uh, let's see if we can uh, make use of that uh, from VPS. Well, uh, we have to have a hook in, 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 in the right place, it seems, uh, on the receive path. Uh, the UDP receive message uh, handler um, has access to both the SPD, the packet we're just receiving, and the message buffer where the user space process has ended up and ended as memory for the ancillary message. And that will involve the uh, receive message uh, keyword code for us. Uh, the question is, how do, what, do, what do we need to do for to actually uh, populate the key message buffer the, uh, that the user space has ended. Uh, well, um, we already have, kind of have all the code in the kernel to, to, to do that, to, uh, to do all the validation and lay out the data in the way it's expected by the user space in the form of like put key message helper. Um, so perhaps we could just expose that BPF, wrap it as a, as a case file, um, and that way the BPF program itself doesn't have to worry about dealing with the layout and then and, and doing it properly. Um, that, uh, that helper will do all the difficult part of accessing uh, the memory, uh, except, you know, it's a user space memory, so we need to now worry about page load. So in order to be able to do that, uh, we would actually need uh, the receive message programs to be allowed to be loaded as two public programs. Um, this needs to work. Um, <laughs> of course, these are limited uh, as to what they can use, but uh, yeah, we have we seem to have all the all the stuff in the context already, so perhaps that's that's the way to go. Um, we can do that. Um, how it how it how it looks, uh, how it can look from your BPF code. So it's pretty straightforward. We can get uh, our hands on the message object uh, from from the context we receive. And then we just uh, act on on the message object and pass uh, additional key message data in there. 
Right, so back on the receive path, um, what about uh, going the other way? Uh, what if we want to pass um, data from user space and we want it to be stored as metadata in, in, the, in the SKB? Uh, first question is, do we have the same issue with accessing user pages, memory pages? Uh, well, fortunately not, because uh, it happens, it still happens that the uh, that the physical uh, layer um, already uh, does the hard work for us and actually copies uh, all the selected buffer to kernel memory. So that makes life easier. So that uh, leads us to the question uh, of where do we want run our DPF code to extract the key message and then write it uh, to SKB headroom. We have a corresponding hook uh, on the temp path. Uh, um, it's run because it was introduced for a different purpose. So it was introduced so we can rewrite the destination address. Unfortunately, today it gets executed only for unconnected UDP sockets. Whereas we might want to do it for connected UDP sockets as well because they uh, are in use, maybe not on ingress because. Tricky, that's crazy, but on ingress they are sometimes used. Um, but perhaps we can, you know, uh, repurpose it. Um, what what do we what do we need to do there to to make it easy for users to be able to walk and access the metadata? So perhaps we could uh, introduce an open source interface, you know, for uh, macros that we use in user space to walk over key messages. It seems to match really nicely to the uh, open code iterator that we have in BPF. And if we, you know, so if we, if we try to do that, we end up with uh, something looking like that, where we can just use a for, a for each uh, helper, uh, where we uh, ask it to, to, to iterate over key messages. Uh, and in, in, in the background, that helper uh, will just delegate to our, our open code to iterate it. But that's not all, because we're simply just working the vector of key message header. And, and we're, we're still left with the question how do we actually access the data of each key message, right? How can we expose that? Well, that's where BPF Dynamic Pointer seems to be a really good fit, uh, it seems. Um, we just uh, introduced a new type of a dynamic pointer uh, that would give you access to C message data and you would just access it as a dynamic pointer read-only slice just like we do today for other types of dynamic pointers. Um, yeah, uh, and that way we could get our hands uh, on, yeah, on the, on the uh, metadata that user space has accessed. Now, there is one problem remaining. Uh, on the send message path, we don't have access to the SKB yet. Uh, that's, that's not allocated until later, uh, until we get to the IP layer. Uh, so we, we, we can't transfer it from C message to SKB. Uh, uh, what can we do there? Well, perhaps we can uh, uh, use the same trick as before and store it temporarily in uh, socket storage because we do have. Uh, as pockets, which we're using to send the packet in, in, in our context, and then use another hook that we ha happen to have in the IP layer um, that gets called whenever we send out a packet from uh, from one of the processes with an SD group. That's not great, but uh, I guess that's uh, what we could do with existing hooks. Uh, it's not great because you know that hook runs on every packet that we send out, and we would be less interested in, in setting it, uh, uh, you know, for packets where the user space has actually handed up something. So this is this is actually an open question where we would love to hear some ideas and opinions because this actually seems to be the last missing uh, piece of the puzzle here. And back to you. Thanks, Jackie. And now we're going to talk about kind of the elephant in the room, which is the, the format of the metadata. So of course, with 256 bytes, you've kind of solved the how many bits can I use problem. You can use as many bits as you want, pretty much, which 
the problem of which bits can I use or which bytes can I use and will I interfere with other services? And it feels like we shouldn't need a registry on GitHub to track who's using what bytes with the metadata. Of course, uh, the simple approach is just to use a binary block to get like a struct. Uh, the process is very simple, uh, but the real cause is if you have different services from different vendors, it's fairly unclear how they would cooperate there. Would you configure them to use different bytes to tell them, hey, you know, the field you want is, you know, bit 0 to 32, can I allocate it in the struct or not? Um, so we have a lot of not great ideas for potential outcomes, but certainly we're looking for feedback. Uh, so one thing that kind of at first glance seems appealing is maybe we could use BTS and core, and then you could use BTS to describe the format or the layout of the metadata. Um, and then with the power launcher and everywhere, theoretically everything should just work. Um, and ideally the pro would be that then you can change the layout, and as long as you, your field that you want is still there, everything would work. But in practice, it doesn't really work very well because core assumes types don't change at runtime, and so at load time you pass them up and find what the right type is. But if you have a running service and you want to add a new field to your metadata, then potentially the BTS won't change. Uh, it's also not clear how do you get the BTS ID, so then maybe it ends up being this mess on the right here where you actually have to support reading different kinds of BTS IDs, and then it all kind of falls apart. Um, but maybe then instead, if we need curl support, it should just be some magical map, and you could use something like map look at the end and register keys with a kernel to get the value you want back out. Um, but also unclear, this ends up being very complicated. Um, and finally, someone should, we could also use like type length value kind of things, so we could just have some format people kind of mostly agree on. Uh, of course, a con there, if you need to parse through every and walk the whole chain every time, then you go for, I mean, for those of you that parse IPv6 extension headers, this is kind of the same mess all over again. Um, so it's kind of very painful. Um, yeah, that's it for everything we have. So yeah, we'd love to hear any thoughts, on, mostly on the format of the metadata, and if we're, are we overthinking this? Could it just be a binary blob and everyone does whatever? Um, adding another complication to this. Yeah. Um, as you alluded to a bit earlier, we have the um, internal support to get the hardware metadata search, which is what we can't currently consume it in the stack. Yeah. Uh, and that's not like for, for this, um, we cover different uses of BTS, but we also want the kernel itself to be able to, to consume this metadata when it's not in FKB, so we can, uh, for example, use the hashed and timed Scan after you have redirected to a CPU map, for example, and then you build it in FKB in a different CPU. Um, and I think also the, uh, uh, the this was originally proposal for uh, the BTS thing that also a little bit fell down on this, but yeah. the stack itself is also a consumer. And we haven't thought. And so what I'm, I'm like, what we ended up with for the FTP metadata itself was the case launch for the metadata area that was um, that was involved. Um, so you know, maybe a, a set of helper functions could be related to this. It would sort of get you two of these. Like the kernel would keep track of the offsets, so you could like um, register metadata. ID, and then the kernel would allocate some space uh, and keep track of the offset, so I can just do, please give me my ID, um, and then that could be sort of a uh, either per netdef or per global namespace. And, and that's sort of a little bit similar to what we did with the case launch for the XTP metadata. You just have different functions you call for different uh, values, but, but here you would could also have, like, instead of having different case launch, you could have an ID. Yeah, okay. That would, that, that would be my immediate thought. Yeah, so, yeah, I think that's kind of what we were thinking of with, like, this magic map, kind of similar vibe, you know, you could look up the kernel, hey, can I have an ID for, I want four bytes of metadata, can you tell me an ID, and then the kernel deals with all the, how it's stored, and it's kind of an internal detail. But of course, that ends up being really complicated, and is it worth having such an API? Does anyone care? I think along the lines of what Toki was saying, um, at least to the feedback, you probably also need to be able to figure out 
depending what level of information you store in the metadata, is that going to get aggregated? Is it going to kill GRO? So thankfully, yes. So today it kills GRO. So if the metadata, so GRO today checks if the metadata is different or not. Mm. Um, but I think we have a culture yet in working on patches to selectively disable, enable GRO, which could potentially let you, you know, supply like a merging strategy, like, okay, I don't want to force GRO on, but if the metadata is first, just keep the first block or something like this. Um, and transmit segmentation may be the easiest process. Yes, 100%. Yeah. I know, like, I, I feel like for the format, I would just put the a little bit of a blob, but I mean, we would never solve every this problem that we might have. I don't know. This is my opinion. I mean, it's really hard. Like, so everyone has different use cases, like different ways how they look at certain problems in their stack. And yeah. Um, I had a similar to the other question. So, if we uh, were closing the data to the bucket and just pushing it down, like, also consider just uh, building this natively into the socket API instead of kill chunks and this is like this is something that we want to have without explicitly having to call kill chunks or something. Just make it a single part of the socket API and then have it as a if there will be gap and if there is now that blah blah whatever. And then you can do this simplified. Well, let me see if I understand uh, the part for uh, what Goldberg uh, is. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's, yeah, like, like pushing the data in and out of the message and, and stuff like that. Like, I think that's the thing. I think it's part of the are only from the BCF context, so that's why that's why I'm getting lost. So you're you're saying which I mean, makes I mean, I mean, like when, whenever this bucket reads an SKD, you just have to layer the metadata and just make it like into the. I see. So we, uh, yes, it's a to so to say to make networks like of a, uh, aware of that yeah. the metadata exists uh, and it handles the authority. Yeah, this actually actually might be a part of a solution for that last missing piece. Because as, as you said, it's really hard to do. We, we would need some planning, some awareness from the net, network side that has, metadata has been packed together with a message, and we need to propagate it to the SKD. So th this might be the, the way to go in the end. And then my other question was whether you looked into, whether you audited all this SKD and uh, core functions, whether this is preserved all the way, right? Whether like. Like by then, I, I I wasn't quite sure. Like I, I mean, like from the execute to the people layer, it's quite clear and simple. But like then, it's more fuzzy up to some extent. Like I I looked into that. Like I couldn't copy and then all of the stuff. Like yeah, if you want to, I guess all that covered. Copying seems to preserve it. So this CSKD expand head, but that's like an easy fix to have it uh, move the metadata out. Um, so it seems like we have a proof concept in the metadata. Maybe there are edge cases we haven't quite figured out yet that we don't know of, yeah. but everything seems to work. Okay. Well, to maybe add one thing to that, uh, one thing you could clash with is if you uh, want to push too many encapsulation headers, and then what do you do when you run out of space because you have metadata there already? The problem we have is that everything's dynamic. Like all, all the parts like Keyscope and R and everything's completely dynamic. We can't like reserve fixed subnets for fixed things. It's all kind of we we will just bounce it off the other system. I might have missed it, but um, did you do any performance stuff? Like is it I guess the headroom is coming from the device that's in the headroom field. And uh, if sometimes those are tuned for like that are going to actually be used 
Right, so as soon as you add headroom and their tunnels, do you just immediately have to add a group? So, yeah, so the default headroom, like if you don't have XDP, the yeah. default XDP headroom is like 32 bytes, which isn't really, probably isn't enough for anyone to use. Right. With, like, as soon as you have an XDP program attached, it's bumped to 256 in most browsers. And then it yeah. goes like no matter what. I mean, unless you're using some really crazy end cap, it's right. probably right. going through. There are a few exceptions. I think Broad comes like 180 bytes or something, but. So you always attach a, you, you sort of have to attach the XDP key to get the. Yeah, at least in. today. Maybe that's something that could change. Um, Interesting. Okay. And we have a dumb question to you. Do, do we know do, do we know how expensive it's using the SKB with this? It's really expensive. Yeah. 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 We haven't benchmarked or anything, but I think we've just kind of all assumed internally that you'd have to do an extra allocation per thing, and if you use it for every packet, that ends up being expensive. Um, and we already have this base that even like these 256 bytes aren't being used entirely, and they're already kind of preserved throughout the whole stack. So we might as well use those. But we haven't benchmarked it or measured it or anything. Okay. Yeah. I know MPPPP is using it. Have, have you guys measured how expensive it is? If you want this to work from XDP as well, that could be edge for the non start anyway. Right. I actually wonder whether, like, once we get this working, I mean, we probably also have the, XD, the SKB extension used to metadata area, but it probably could be the other way you want because it's really expensive to work with, right? I mean, <laughs> One last <coughs> kind of question, I guess. Uh, if you actually, if you come up with this magic blue plus map, not not really map, where you can hack it into, let's say, whatever, 100 bytes, 120 mm -hmm. bytes, something with some kind of a key on KPI where you can sort of marshal on marshal, maybe not marshal, but do you like think it that if everything somehow fits with like 100 bytes or 100 bytes and you can put stuff like in small things up to, I don't know, maybe like 16 bytes, like make it really small, uh, then I can see many use cases beyond just beyond just like how you would represent the metadata. Mm -hmm. So this kind of like mini storage, just small number of bytes and key like access. So when you essentially divide the conquer problem to like many m m small, let's say make key of this like integer and all, all this like use cases and value up to some number of bytes and come up with some kind of a format where the mm -hmm. compaction, marshalling and like query is fast, that can be like really useful in many other cases. Just like a bunch of people put like values and values and now in, BT, in BTF, just like BTF uh, distress block, but if it can get this extra TV like stuff, it would be pretty cool. Actually, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, I think it helps a lot with also with Daniel's idea of like the entire user space API. If he was posing just this whole binary block for user space, it also kind of gets awkward because every application needs to know the format then. Whereas if you have some kind of fields, you can imagine putting like one field for C message or something like this, the user space gets uh, slightly nicer. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you have this like TV thingy, 100 bytes, then user space can have just as well, just a similar algorithm in terms of here's my header that I'm standardizing, maybe bit compacted or byte compacted, and user space can just like extract stuff from there. Yeah. Thank you for people. <laughs>